Well, first of all, yeah, I want to say I'm really excited to be here, right and um, I'm a little intimidated because you've get had two excellent speakers. Um, they didn't wait. tell me that was because what was going to go on before me the when they asked me to come. Banks, so. Um, Hopefully, I could do justice. Um, I also want to let you guys know that I, mean, you guys I am here as a fellow society, business owner everything. running a company the rest of this stuff, and the stuff I really trying I to get to the next level for, with my exist. company. So yeah. what I'm going to talk about is this supposed is to be helpful to you, and I am okay well. with you guys interrupting you me, business. asking questions. This is about it, do it my now. information being and useful you to you, not about me standing up here and talking. I can't paint. I'm going to work on it. It might get a little bit cheaper. But that's not something that... I can throw up a canvas and do so. This is about goes, this is as cheap as me it's ever going to kind get. of helping you, so you need to uh, grow understand into it how lean it's, might apply to your business scary, through what we are doing scary. at Palo Alto Software you know, the stock, and through and, and don't our worry about experience. Stock market with does this, planning the economy does and managing this, and, the twain shall and innovating. Entrepreneurs and, need to be worried you know, about the economy and their business. Today is, is all about innovating. Market. So as we go along, raise your hand, wave it if I don't see it, and I'm definitely here to Certainly. facilitate the information that you all find to be the best for your business. So we're going to talk first about lean planning. We're a business planning company. That's what we do. We started in 1987 yes. in Palo Alto, California. We're not in Palo Alto anymore. I actually have the privilege of living in the Northwest. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we are now based in Eugene, Oregon, um, which is a great place to have a company. and. Um, run a company and lifestyle and being able I, to I, kind of do everything I need to do and still uh, real also real uh, remember the ABCs the I talked about in there is, so uh, that should start that should start it's easier than in beautiful Palo Alto where I grew up and I'm from months. and I love but again, it's not as the, easy the of a place got to get staffed um, Palo Alto the underwriting has been to, the leader the, in the whole business reason planning the, software for small businesses since about 1994 was to increase liquidity and it really has nothing to do with interest rates it's to get the the bond buyers, ago, the buyers of mortgage-backed bonds, to say, okay, I'm willing to come back into the marketplace because the Fed's there planning. buying half of them. And the principles that makes them feel like they've got a big brother there with them. And to take so it to where we are today. So as they come in, and then you get all this demand um, so for lean mortgages, methodology, the banks it have like to a, meet it by making more Quite a few of you have heard of it. How many have actually read Lean Startup? And so what that means is, instead of sitting back on their throne saying you can have a loan and you can't, if you have a chance, it's a fast read. I know there's a million books in your business book list. But if you have a chance. You know, it definitely has some really interesting work. ideas. But what you're Enforce seeing what? is that yes. everybody is attracted to it. Everybody Listen. wants lean in their business. And Eric really wrote this book for startups. And if right. you really right. look at what he did and read the book, he wrote it for high tech, high growth yeah. startups. Right? So he didn't do it for all startups. Well, well, and he didn't well, do it for a, existing businesses. I think, I think and his you're methodologies looking at and principles the, the real estate market really should actually go through this bottoming process. I think. When I say the bottoming process, Process. We're in the process of doing that now. The residential to real the estate should high be able to hit high that tech company. next year. So how many on a of national here are startups average in high basis. tech uh, with venture capital funding? Right, right. So very few. So how do, how do we then take lean startup okay, and how do we Very apply good. it and, and what are those principles and gems that we can take I know, they, they out all of what get, Eric has talked about. No, no, you're, and you're, what's you're fascinating about what Eric has done is what he said is the reason that startups I in high growth I will. I, I gotta go write the um, and in high and tech don't I'll make it is that right. you have engineers and idea people who oh. decide on something and build it and then release it. And it sometimes works and it sometimes is very successful. But most times, if you build in a black box and you build the perfect thing, well, and yeah, then I mean, you release great. it, customers yeah, go, oh, that's great, yes. but I wanted this and I that's wanted very that, good. and I wasn't aware of that I needed that, and I'm not sure oh, you about did, that. Right, and that's right, why a, a lot of, of companies ago. don't get off the ground, because they build in a black box, and they release, and then they expect everybody to come, right? If you build it, they will come, and then they don't come. So what Eric really says is, well, don't do that release quickly and get things out there and have a minimum viable product and you know release six times a day he says well clearly you can only do that if you're a high-tech company right how many of you can release something six times a day right N none of us can right that's not possible you can only do that if you're this very specific company so how do we take that and and how do we take his methodology of ideas build and code because he's talking about engineering and high tech, measure, data, 
learn, and back to ideas. How do you take that in an everyday existing business? So first of all, take the code out of there, right? If you have a product that you have to code, great. You can leave it in there, but that's inconsequential. You don't have to do that. What you really have to think about is lean planning and lean innovation. That's what you have to think about. How do you take what he has said for these very specific niche companies and apply it to your business. Um, and the first thing you do have to do is go back to the planning side of it. You have to get your ideas, right? You, you are dead in the water without ideas. And a company that isn't innovating in whatever industry you're in is gonna die. And everybody knows, innovate or die. That's where we are and that's why you guys are all here. That's why Eric Wall is such an inspiring speaker. That's why what Roger says about you know, economics is something that we all want to know. You know, the gentleman over here, how do I take your knowledge and apply it to my business, right? We're all idea people. We're all trying to innovate. And you innovate or you die. So you have your ideas. But in order to actually innovate and take them somewhere, you do have to plan. And planning can be boring. I know this. I work for a planning company. It's not boring to me, but I know a lot of people say it's boring. I don't have time for that. And then I do all these plans and they change, so why bother? I've got this 50-page plan. I stick it in a drawer and then it's done and it's not useful at all. And you hear a lot of this going on. Um, a lot of chatter sort of out there in thought leadership about, oh, nobody reads business plans. Nobody writes business plans. You shouldn't have a business plan. I agree. Don't have a business plan. No, that is not what you need. What you need to be doing is lean planning. It's about an ongoing process. It's about taking that circle that Eric talks about, ideas, building, measure and learn, and then go back to the drawing board and having this ongoing planning that helps you get to where you're going. Right? None of us would hop in the car today and drive to my offices in Eugene, Oregon without Googling it, right? You'd get a map, you'd figure out where you're going, and, you know, Google these days might give you three or four different routes. You might stop along the way in Portland and meet up with some fellow EOers. There might be things that you do, but you know where you're going and you have a map. And it doesn't mean that you're going to go exactly that route. It just know you know where that end goal is. You know where you want to get. And that's what planning is all about. You're not going to be right. You know, and if you are, and if you have built a plan and a budget and a forecast that is always right and you're never wrong, I don't think you should be sitting here. I think you should go and be an investment banker and buy lots of stocks because if you can predict the future and if that's something that you re can really do, then you're not like the rest of us normal people. Most of us can't predict the future, and most of us struggle with what decisions should I make? Is that the right decision? Did I do the right thing? We have this long hallway that we go down as CEOs and presidents and owners of companies, and you're walking down that hallway and doors are opening all the time. Do I go down that door or do I keep going down the hallway? And the more that you know where the end of the hallway leads, the more you can decide which doors to open and which doors to close. And that's what planning is all about. And that's what lean planning is all about. It's about planning just enough so that you know where you're going. And it is about financial planning. You have got to have a budget and a forecast. Not because it's going to be right, but it helps you and the people on your management team and your employees understand where you're going. And if halfway down that hallway that changes, you change. That's why it's planning. It's an ever-evolving process. You don't change it every day. You probably don't change it every month. But once a quarter, you're probably looking back and seeing, am I doing what I said? Is my company going where it needs to be? Are the assumptions that I use to create my plan correct? And if they're not, you make adjustments. And if you're doing that, then you can get to the lean innovation side of it. Then you can really start to have that freedom and feel less of the constrictions of the financial health of your company and where it's going, and you can really start thinking about the innovation side of it. So the reason there's a goldfish with a shark fin in terms of lean innovation, anybody want to take a guess? 
So if you've read Eric Ries and Lean Startup, he talks about a minimum viable product. And that's what you want to get out there to your customers. You don't want to build the perfect thing. Um, you know, I'm in the middle of reading Steve Jobs' biography, which is fascinating. And um, with everything that goes on in my life, I never thought I'd get through a 600-page book. And I find I can't put it down. Um, he did not practice lean innovation. <laughs> So if you've read Steve Jobs, he, but he is also, you read it and you go, my God, this guy is one in a million. He is an incredible master of thought. And we'd all, I think, like to aspire to that. But his, you know, building the Mac over two and a half years and black boxing it and not releasing it and basically saying, I don't care what you guys think the customer wants, I know better. If we can all be Steve Jobs, great. And if you're Steve Jobs, fantastic. But that's not really who most of us are. And that's the reason that there's a 600-page biography of him that you can't stop reading is because of who he is. Lean innovation is really about trying to figure out what your minimum viable product is that you can put out there. Now, if you're a startup and you're following Eric Ries, it's bare bones. It's barely anything. It's a prototype. It's not even a beta. But let's be honest, we're all running companies. We all have brands. We all have people who trust us. We have equity in what you've built. And you just can't put a lot of slap together stuff out there. So what is a minimum viable product to an existing company, to a small business that's growing? It's not the same as what it is to that group of engineers sitting in the Y Combinator accelerator in the Silicon Valley. They can afford to put stuff out there that's maybe a little more haphazard than those of us running companies can afford to put out there. So that's why the, um, the shark fin and the goldfish, right? You want it to look like a shark fin if somebody's looking at it from above the water, and only you know that it's a goldfish underneath. That's what it's about. How do you put that out there without building the whole shark? You'll get to the shark if that's what's going to work, but you want to test it. You want to test to see if the shark is what people want, and you want to build the goldfish in order to test. So we're going to go really into the case study of Palo Alto Software. In the last three years, we have transitioned the company. Um, and we've made a big leap in both business model and in technology. And it's the type of thing that a lot of people cautioned us um, a, a lot of people that I trust as advisors were very worried about to transition not just technology but business model. And to try to do that quickly can be very risky and very scary. But it's what I knew that we needed to do. When the recession hit in fall of uh, 08, I'd barely been running the company for nine, 10 months. And it really was that time of like, oh my god, this is do or die. How are we going to get from this to the next thing? Shrink-wrapped Windows software. We all know it. We probably have hated some of it. Um, and it's something that will probably exist for some time, but not, not very long, right? We don't. Those of you who are more into technology probably have already moved away from this. Probably everything that you use is in the cloud, subscription. You probably never install anything on your machine. If you look at the you know, generation that's coming, the millennials, I don't even think they know what shrink wrap software is. I think if you show them a box, they're going to be like, what? Is that from the 80s? What in the world is that? They have no idea. This is not going to take my company to the future. And we knew that, and we understood that. And we understood that just as the recession hit, and we had to really figure out, how do we keep this company going while innovating and trying to figure out what is the next thing? So we started the planning, and started the thinking, and started the ideas so that we could get to this. We now, our flagship product is now Live Plan, and it's in the cloud, and it's a subscription model and it is a product that helps businesses with the planning and the management side of things. But we started here and we did not release Live Plan until April of 2011, about a year and a half ago. Um, and in the process we had to hire an entirely new technology team 
train customer service, really get some different marketing talent in the door. I mean, basically, going from this to that in a smaller company, we have 50 employees, is a big challenge. You basically have to retool the whole company. And you've got to deal with both a financial business model that's going to change and a technology that's completely different. So the first thing is we use the right tools. In order to get from the shrink wrap software to the cloud, you've got to be extremely organized and you've got to really understand all the pieces. As the CEO leading this big initiative, I had to make sure we could get there, right? I have 50 people who depend on me, who get a paycheck for me, who have mortgages and, you know, car payments and kids in schools. And, you know, I didn't have the luxury of saying, well, if I don't get paid, that's okay. We're just going to, you know, full speed ahead, damn the torpedoes. I can't do that. I'm running a company and I need to be able to make sure that the company stays financially healthy for all these other employees. So we use the right tools. Uh, we use Basecamp. We use Jira. We use Google Docs. We use Google Hangout. We use LivePlan, our own tool. Um, and then we had cash. We had money. And that is an important tool, definitely, when you're making the type of transition that we're making. You've got to be able to understand everything that you need. And for us, cash was a big one. And one of the reasons cash was very important in our transition is we went from a business model when we had box software where we were selling it primarily on our websites, although you can still buy it today at Staples and Office Depot and Office Max and Best Buy. Um, but primarily we sell it on our website and we charge anywhere from $100 to $199, but depending on what version you get. So we were getting an average of $140 every time somebody purchased this, immediately. Credit card, money in the bank, no AR, great way to be. Some of it does come in in AR from retail, but you know, you're not going to buy this type of stuff in retail for long, and we've all heard how Best Buy is doing, not so good, and a lot of these big box stores are struggling. So really, we were getting most of our income from one-time purchases of a shrink wrap software product for $140. Um, when you go to this, now we're getting $19.95 a month. So pretty scary as a CEO to say, okay, let's launch LivePlan, and now I don't get those $140. Now I only get $19.95. I don't know, is this going to convert at the same rate? Are enough people going to buy it? Am I going to end up getting that $140, am, or am I not? Are we going to have to downsize? Are we going to have to go into debt? How are we going to make that transition from immediately getting $140 to needing seven months before we get $170, uh, $140? Um, so one of the ways that I made sure that we could do this was to have money in the bank. And over the last three years, we were stockpiling cash in an effort to know that this is what we were going to need. We needed to be able to be debt free and with money in the bank. So that one is the only one of those tools that isn't a tool that's also in the cloud. As we innovate and as we move to the cloud, that's what we use. We live and breathe it because that's what our customers are doing as well. And frankly, it's a great way to do business. And if you're not using tools that are in the cloud, you probably are taking too much time in IT. You're probably spending too much money. There are such great, inexpensive solutions to run your company out there. And if you're not using them, look into them. Some of them are free, Google Docs. Some of them are, you know, I think we pay $70 a month for Basecamp. And we have probably 70 projects going on at any given time in Basecamp. From my perspective as a CEO, I can go into Basecamp at any given moment and know exactly what everybody is working on, where we are in the process, who's done what, who's said what. I don't look at everything, but I get my daily digest from Basecamp of the changes and things that are going on. Jira is the way we manage our development process to make sure our developers know what they have to do and the features and the bugs and the things that they have to build. Um, Google Hangouts, we have people in different areas. We are moving towards more of a virtual model like many people are. Talent is hard to come by. If they happen to live in 
you know, London or Portland or Bend or San Francisco, we don't want to not hire the best A players because of their location. So we use Google Hangouts and we never, ever, ever email Microsoft documents, ever, because they're a pain in the ass. Anyone who's used them, you know, then is that the document? Wait, you're working on the one that I sent last week. That's not the new one. I sent you another one on Sunday night. Didn't you see it? And it's a mess. So everything goes to Google Docs. And if anybody ever sends me an attachment that's got a Microsoft Office document, I delete it. And I email them and I say, send it the right way on Google Docs. And there's other places that you can use it. You can track. You can see what's going on. You can see the last changes. You can revert. If somebody goes and messes with all my copy and I don't like it, I can go back to a previous revision and tell them stop messing with my documents. I can also go in and see when was something created, when was it edited, did the person do what I wanted them to do. Um, they can also make sure that I've been in there. So everything that we do is pretty much online and in the cloud and it's also a way to live what we're putting out there for our customers. The right process. So the other thing that we needed to do when we switched from the shrink wrapped to the cloud was to figure out how are we going to do this. We were a Windows development shop. That's what we did. That's the developers that we had. That's the management for the developers that we had. And we needed to switch and jump from the one goldfish jar to the next. We needed to become a SaaS development house. And in order to do that, we needed to have the right process. So we are an agile development house. Um, those of you in technology um, have hopefully heard of agile. Um, and those of you not in technology should think about how agile development can work in your businesses. Agile is just exactly what it is. It's about being agile, about moving quickly. And it really, it's about taking a lot of what Eric Reese is saying in the Lean Startup and applying it to development. You cannot implement what Eric says about the Lean Startup in a high-tech company if you are not using agile development. So the reason this picture is here of a rugby scrum is we use the scrum methodology, which is a sprint method. You get your all your engineers onto sprint teams and you develop a sprint that's a certain amount of time. So for us, our sprints are four weeks. That works out great. It's a month, which is a metric everybody can understand. Every month we release new features. Every month I know what's on the docket for the next month. But the really cool thing about Agile is even though we've got a list of features that could take us the next 24 months to build, we do not have that list ready to go. I cannot tell you what we're going to build in February. I can tell you all the things I'd like to build in the next two years, but I can't tell you what's going to happen in January. Right now, we're as a management team going through what we're actually going to build in December. Right now, we're working on Sprint 28. That means there's been 28 months of development for LivePlan. I always know exactly where we are in the development of LivePlan because every sprint has a number and that coincides to a month. So right now, that sprint will be over, and we will launch new features November 17th, and then we'll start on our next sprint. So our process allows us to be very agile. It allows us every month to put something out and then let our customers get back to us, do surveys, look at analytics, look at conversion rates, look at use, look at what people are actually doing, and then come together as a management team with our list of stuff that would take us the next two years to do and prioritize it based on what we're actually seeing so that we can then take that lean methodology and apply it to our ongoing existing company. Um, a sprint process also forces developers to start, stop thinking about scheduling things in terms of man hours. If you've ever worked with developers, you pretty much, as a rule, multiply their time estimates by about 10, right? So they say, oh, it'll take two hours to build. And I go, okay, so that's 20 hours later. And that's just how it works with developers. So the um, Scrum methodology takes that out of there. You no longer talk about hours. You talk about points. And you, the first time you do this, you allocate a random number of points. So we started and we said, our development team is going to do 90 points. 
and you schedule things out and things that you know exactly, they're little, they're tiny, they're not going to take a lot of time to build are at one point. Something that's bigger and more complex is going to be a more nebulous 40 points. And what you aim for is you try to get your team estimating things in the smallest number of points possible. Because what you're saying when you get to 20, 30, 40 points is you're actually saying I have no idea. So I'm just going to give it this big chunk and I'm going to say that's how much time it's going to take. Pretty much as a rule. I mean, there was, there's been a couple of times when it went maybe a week longer or we launched a week earlier. So there's been a few times. But the way you manage it is when you set up the team, the first few sprints, you're not necessarily going to do everything you set out to do, but you will launch. And you will launch at the end of every sprint. So the first few sprints, you won't actually know what your development team can do. It's a best guess. And for us, it's adjusted as we've gone along because we've hired more developers. So as we hire more developers, we can accommodate more points. But it doesn't happen immediately, right? The first few months that a developer comes on board, they're learning. They're not developing as much. So I would say the first six, seven months of our sprint process were a little bit more nebulous. We had goals of the things we wanted to do. And to be honest, one of the things that's been great is that it allowed our developers to also set their own goals. And for the most part, they met them, even if it meant working some really long hours, which we didn't require them. They wanted to meet their goals. So it was a really cool kind of team environment. But the first six or seven sprints, you're figuring out what you can do. 28 sprints into it, we know what we can do. And we know what we're capable of. And when something is 40 points, we don't ever say we're going to do that in this sprint. What we say is, in this sprint, we're going to allocate seven points to investigating the 40-point project. And then the 40-point project, by the next sprint, becomes a smaller project. And in the sprint process, you also have a lot of work on the project management side that our developers don't do. We write stories for every single feature. And when I say stories, if I, as a CEO, say, I want live plan to have a beautiful way to present a pitch. That's probably 50 stories that I just shoved onto my VP of uh, product development to develop. Because how do you get to the pitch that Sabrina wants is one story. What do you do at the very top of it is another story. How do you add your logo is another story. So you get very good at being very detailed about writing stories. We separate it. We, and you, you could, but we separate it. We pay people according to market rate and you know, their backgrounds and what they bring to the table. Um, but And company-wide, we do bonuses based on overall company performance. Um, but we don't tie compensation to sprint points. We really want it to be about letting the developers have as much say in the process and innovating and being able to say, I can't do that in that time period. Um, not quite being the Steve Jobs and his alternate real distortion reality field, um, which you might get if you tied points to compensation. So that goes back to that lean planning, right? Part of the planning has to be the high level goals and infrastructure of what you want that product to be. And every month, we do infrastructure work. And the other thing that we've learned from past mistakes is we hired a senior architect who's done this before and understands it and knows. So every month, we're working on scalability, uh, security, and the ability to have stability. So there's always points allocated to that. But we started the product with a platform that we can build upon and that gives us the flexibility. And I'll get to that's really what our minimum viable product was. 
Um, and I'll get to that when, you know, and, and I'll talk about how do you get to that minimum viable product. And in technology, your minimum viable product has to be that, right? It's got to be that skeleton and structure so that you don't get into an architecture problem later. No, we don't. Um, you know, it, it, I think really it's about what are the leaders on our technology team want to do, and I don't, you know, I let them make those decisions. So it's not a specific reason, and I'm not a developer or a coder. I'm very technologically savvy, but I'm the uh, sales and marketing side of things. So um, the other part of the process that's really important in terms of being agile and innovating and getting to where you need to do is to really think about who you're building this for and to understand who this person is that you're building it for. And you can have more than one persona, but I would suggest that initially as you're getting a new product or service out there that you pick one persona. So we picked Garrett. He is the right persona to launch our product. And we have a whole story for Garrett, and this, this is Garrett. He exists in our company, in our office. Is he a real person? Not in the outside world, but to us, he's a real person. And you ask anybody in my office who Garrett is, and they can tell you who Garrett is. And what they'll say is not these bullets. They'll say, Garrett is a passionate bike rider. He loves bikes. He's always wanted to start a business. He's always worked at other things and never really been passionate about it, but he's always been the bike enthusiast. And Garrett finally got the guts to start his business. Garrett is educated. You know, in the small business space, you can talk to people who provide services to the mom and pop businesses, which we do. And there can be companies that aren't very nice about the level of expertise that their mom and pop businesses that they're serving bring to the table. And we don't like to do that. Garrett might be a novice at business, but he's no dummy. He knows what he knows. He knows his expertise in bike riding, and he's looking to other people to help him with expertise in running his business. Um, he's the first time entrepreneur, and he's looking to us for help. So every time we think about a feature we're going to build for Live Plan, every time we think about copy we're going to write about Live Plan, we always ask the question, would Garrett understand this? Would Garrett use it? How would Garrett use it? Does Garrett want this? And I'll tell you, not only has this been great for the marketing team, you can see how it would be great for the marketing team, it has been phenomenal for our developers. Developers are known for wanting to build super cool things that only they think are cool. And then you kind of have to say, yeah, that's really super cool, but uh, no one else is going to get it. Our developers now routinely ask themselves and each other, what did you build? How is Garrett going to use that? And it's just been a phenomenal experience to, to actually see developers understanding that they're building this for a real live person, that they're not just building it because they think it's super cool, that when they think about what they build, they build it for Garrett, and that Garrett is actually going to use it. And beyond building the persona, we've gone all the way. We've developed a logo for Garrett. Uh, Garrett has his own account on Live Plan. Um, we just recently launched a feature to integrate LivePlan with QuickBooks. Garrett has his own QuickBooks file that we've integrated with LivePlan. So Garrett exists and we test the Garrett model out on an ongoing basis. As we move the company forward, as we go to the next steps with LivePlan, we're developing a new persona. And that persona is going to be a female. I'd like to not just have a male entrepreneur. So Susie is going to be five years down the road from Garrett. And that's what we're developing right now as we think about where LivePlan is going to go in the future. And Susie will have her own story just like Garrett so that everybody in the company knows why we're doing what we're doing. And everybody in the company can recognize as they see other entrepreneurs, is this Garrett or is that Susie? So minimum viable product. And this goes to how do you make sure the architecture is the right thing? Eric talks about the minimum viable product and that you should really, even if it's vaporware, he says, like it doesn't even have to exist, but you know, get your idea, code it really quickly, put it out there. And that's why he talks about releasing things five times a day, which clearly is not something any existing business can do or should do. And I think you would be crazy if you tried to do. You can't do that. You've got to have 
QA. You need to make sure that you're releasing something that is of quality. This is a company that I'm running that's been around since 1987. Um, it's been successful. It's been the market leader. And if that isn't enough of a pressure, it's my dad's company. He started it in 1987 and gave it to me to run it in 2007. So when we put something out there, I've got to think of not only what everybody else is going to think, but what is my dad going to think? And what is he going to think about what we've put out there? So our minimum viable product has to be of a certain quality. And so we struggle with that as a company. We struggle with wanting to finesse it, wanting it to be as perfect as possible, but then it doesn't allow us to test. So it's something to really consider. Once you think about that minimum viable product, what you're really saying is when can we launch? When is the soonest time that I can get this out there? And I love this quote from Lauren Michaels because it's right. You know, you're never going to get it perfect. You're going to have to get it out there. It's going to have to launch. In the case of Saturday Night Live, it launches at 11.30 on Saturday night because that's when it launches. You have to figure out and put a launch date, and that means it has to be some sort of minimum viable product. So how did we figure out what this minimum viable product was going to be? Was this enough? Were, was it going to appeal to Garrett? Did we build the right product? And we had a lot of discussions internally and a lot of conflict from the management team of we can't release something that's not good enough, but we have to release something really quickly. And how do you come together on get something out there, but it's got to be perfect, but get something out there, but it's got to be perfect. And we discuss this all the time. So what we decided was we were going to release a minimum viable product, and we we're going to release it to a very specific audience. So we released it to the Mac audience in our website network. We run a website network where we have free content, tools, um, and we attract about a million unique visitors a month to our website network just from organic listings. We don't pay for the traffic. We've been lucky enough and hardworking enough to build up this content presence and get these users coming in. So we're thinking of launching Live Plan and we're trying to weigh everything. I'm not going to get $140 anymore. I'm going to get $19.95. We've got to launch something and figure it out. How do we figure it out? Well, we had a Windows product, yet we know from all our analytics that Mac people were coming to our website. So what we decided to do in April of 2011 is to launch a simple planning application, online planning application, with simple financials. It did not have the full financials that we wanted. It did not have a balance sheet and a cash flow, which we think are, is vital. We don't think you can run a company without understanding your cash flow, but we had to make some compromises. We had to put a minimum viable product out there. It had to look good. It had to be branded well. It had to be scalable. It had to be secure. It had to be the right look and feel because we're an existing company. We've been around since 1987. But it also had to get out there. So we got it out there in April of 2011, and we did a browser detect. If you had a Mac, you were presented with a pop-up or, and we did lots of different tests. We did some pop-ups, we did some flags on the bottom, we did uh, some ads throughout our website based on that Mac Detect. If you had a Mac and you came to our website network in April of 2011, you were presented with Live Plan. Otherwise, nobody else saw it. And our business went on as usual with all the other people who went to our website. So we were able to start testing that hypothesis of how many people are actually going to convert. We thought at 1995 we'd get more people to convert. We, we were hoping that was true. So we launched it, we put it out there, um, and, and started to actually test. And this is where you, you apply that lean methodology. You have to be testing. You have to be measuring, and you have to be looking at the data. So we launched it, we put it out there, and then we start gathering all the data. What, are, what is the conversion rate? What is the conversion rate compared to the Windows conversion rate? What is the conversion rate compared to the old Mac conversion rate? Um, you know, how many people are buying it? Initially, you don't know how long they're going to keep it, right? In April of 2011, the people who bought it, we didn't know how long they were going to be there. I didn't know if we were going to get $20 or $500 from them. So again, launching it to a small portion of our audience allowed us to minimize the risk of that leap to a new business model. And it allowed us to gauge whether we had something that people thought was useful. And the really surprising thing is that 
people loved it and people didn't necessarily care, much to our chagrin, whether there was cash flow and balance sheet. They loved the product and Mac users converted to Live Plan at six times a better rate than they converted to Business Plan Pro. So, you know, immediately you know that there's, there's something there. But of course, those are the Mac people and we had a Windows product. So that doesn't tell you everything, but at least you can start to say, okay, at this point, the conversion rate is 6x. I'm not as afraid. You don't know the retention. You still have to wait for that, and that's going to take time. But you do start to understand the lay of the land and the analytics, and it's about getting it out there and measuring it and then using that data in the right way. So then you listen, and that's a really hard thing to do, right? You love what you put out there. You have a lot invested in it. It's really easy to not want to listen to what people have to say. I know better. You know, they don't know what they need. But it's really important to listen, to put stuff out there, to solicit feedback. Um, as software companies go, if you look, these days it's very, very, very hard to find a phone number. You probably can't find a phone number to call Adobe or Microsoft. Um, even Apple's hard to call. People don't put phone numbers out there. You won't go to a single one of our websites without finding an 800 number. We put our phone number out there. We house our customer service in-house. We don't outsource it because we want to listen to our customers, because we want to know what they're saying. At the top of every single live plan page within the, applica uh, within the application, there's a big feedback button. If you were sending in feedback, and to this day it still happens, in fact, I've got to scold our senior architect and our VP of product development sometimes to say, guys, I really love that you're answering all the customer email, but there's too much right now, and you guys have got to stop doing that and be okay with just looking at what the customer service does. But all those emails come in, I see the emails, the VP of product development sees the emails, our senior architect sees the emails, and we listen to what our customers are saying, and we get that feedback. Now you gotta be careful when you listen, because there is a reason why you are the expert and you're putting it out there. So you can get in this loop where you only listen, and you know, let's remember that the people who are happy usually don't say anything to you, right? It's the people who are ecstatic or the people who are very, very upset. And so you've got to understand when you listen who you're listening to and kind of gauge that middle ground. And you've got to be smart about how you listen. Phone calls, customer emails, surveys. We also listen through analytics. We have a third-party application on our back end of Live Plan. And that third-party application allows us to go one step further than Google Analytics. Currently, we're using Tatango. We're looking at Kissimmee, so we might be changing to the Kiss metrics. But we are listening by seeing what people actually do. And this third-party application tracks actions. Anonymously, in aggregate, we're not looking at what you're doing. We're looking at what everybody is doing or not doing. And so really think about when you listen, all the different ways that you can listen. It doesn't just have to be the people who are actually reaching out to you. You know, it can be you sending out emails, you sending out surveys, and it should be, if you can, gathering data that your customers are giving you, any way that they're giving it to you. So for us, we're lucky enough. Being in the cloud, there's more data than we could ever dream of, and we do a lot with it, and we do as much as we can with it. The other thing you have to do after you listen is you've got to refine. You've got to really understand how to take that feedback. Does anybody know why WD-40 is called WD-40? Exactly. So that's why I put it there for refining, right? It took them 40 different formulas to get to WD-40. They refined and refined and refined and refined, and now it's something that we all probably have in our garages and have used for lots of different purposes at one time or another. So it's about refining and not being afraid of refining. It's going to take a lot of iterations. But that's why an Agile process is fantastic. Agile is set up to refine. So if you don't have a business where you can do Agile development 
in terms of high tech, think about how you can implement an agile process in your business because it allows you to build in the refining part and in refining comes innovation. As you think about how do I make it better today, tomorrow, the next day, and next month, how do I get that better thing out to my customers, you're innovating and you're thinking and the ideas are coming and that's when some of the best ideas are really born is when you're refining and when you're really looking at what you're doing, what worked, what didn't work, and what's going on with your product. As you're building this and you've got your, you know, the, the, the production side of things, whether it's developers, whether it's manufacturers, whether it's, you know, people in the kitchen developing recipes for a restaurant, as you're building this, you also have to be thinking about the other side of it, right? How are you going to market it? How are you going to get it out there to people? And that's got to be part of this innovation process. There are things that you can do and build that will open you up to different channels. And as you listen and as you refine, you've got to keep things in mind. When you think about the architecture of something that you're building, you've got to build it to be flexible so that it can open up opportunities and channels. Inflexibility doesn't build innovation. Inflexibility only builds problems. So the more that you can think about flexibility so that as you look at different marketing channels, there may be small things that you can do to tweak your service or your product that all of a sudden make it great for another channel. And you have to be able to look at that and look at those channel opportunities. But you also have to be able to look at marketing channels and decide when not to open that door. Because there are times when a big company will come to you and they want you to do all kinds of things and it gets you off track. So those marketing channels have to tie back to that planning that you've done. Where do you want to be three years down the road? And if I open this door and I go down this channel and I build what this person wants me to build and it sounds like a great opportunity, does that mean I don't get to where I want to go? Does that mean I go somewhere else? And that may be okay, and it may be a decision you make, but it should be a conscious decision. You shouldn't a year later go, oh shit, I shouldn't have done that. Now we're over here, and I thought I was selling bicycles, and now we're selling motorcycles, and I never wanted to be in the business of selling motorcycles. It should be a very purposeful decision based on where you want the company to go. You need to also think about your sales pipeline, right? Um, salespeople are always selling things you don't have. I don't know if that's just like in their blood or in their nature, but it doesn't matter how many times I tell our salespeople, we don't have that, don't sell that, we don't have that, they're still gonna go out there and sell things that you don't have. The more that they know that there is an innovation process, the more that they know that they can come back and participate in that refinement and talk to you about it, the better off you are because then they start to understand that they can request things that are actually bad for them for the six other deals that I'm working on. Um, but you do have to think about your pipeline and can you actually sell this and can you sell it to the right people? And if not, that's gotta go back into your refinement and that's you know, a, another avenue of listening. You do have to be able to listen because without marketing channels and without a pipeline, you're not gonna go very far. It's just not, it's not going to get you where you need to go. You're gonna refine it again, and you're gonna really go back there, and as you think about the sales pipeline and the marketing channels, you're gonna decide whether or not you build certain things because that channel is worthwhile. And you're gonna go back to that lean innovation and make sure that you're still innovating and building the product that you want to build because this can be a really slippery slope. But the more that you can refine and the more that you have that agile process in place, then the better off you are. So for us with LiPlan, just to bring it back to Palo Alto Software and the case study, um, when we launched LiPlan, we had an existing channel. We have a bunch of people who come to us, they're looking for business planning software, they're looking for business planning help, we sell them live plan, fantastic. For us to get to the next level though, we need to keep those people, we need to retain them. Once we saw the Mac audience, once we saw that they were 6X 
They were converting at 6x the rate of the regular ones. About six months into Live Plan, we opened up the floodgates on our highest trafficked website, bplans.com, which gets about 900,000 unique visitors a month. And we opened up the floodgates to 30% of the traffic on bplans.com, all traffic, not just Mac traffic, to start testing, okay, now we've tested the Mac people. We've seen what they've done. It's been six months down. Our retention at that point, six months into it, was at three months. So six months into a new product, that's a pretty good retention. Uh, you don't have a whole lot of lifespan to really get those people who are going to be there for 24, 36, 48 months that really help extend your average retention. So we were pretty happy with a three-month retention and 6x what we normally got. So we opened up the floodgates to 30% of that traffic. After a month of that, looked at the numbers, and we were converting anywhere between three and a half and four times the number of people. So at that point, I don't have to make $140 every time somebody buys, right? I have to make 25% of that because four times the people are converting. So all of a sudden, because I'm able to understand my metrics, to do my tests, to measure it, and to then apply it to what I'm going to do next, all of a sudden, my stress level and the risk that I'm taking goes way down. So once we realized that three and a half, four X of the people were buying Live Plan, then we were able to say, OK, let's open up the floodgates entirely. And I, I knew at that point, at worst case scenario, we were going to keep doing what we were doing because we had that four X conversion. As the months went on and retention went up, it's been fantastic for us. We've got retention up to a point where we're just at about six months, a year and a half into it, and we're converting at four times the, the number of people. So we were getting $140. We now are getting almost $120. We're about $118, and we convert four times the number of people. So it's been a successful launch. And at this point, Live Plan, uh, it happened a year after we launched the product, April of 2012. Live plan revenue surpassed business plan pro revenue. So we crossed that chasm of surpassing that revenue and getting live plan to be the flagship product and having our cash flow no longer have to take any hit from going to the live plan model. So a year and a half into it, live plan continues to grow. Business plan pro hasn't dropped off to the rate that we predicted because we did those forecasts and those budgets. So all, a lot, all around, it's been more successful than we thought. But I think part of it has to do with that planning, testing, measuring, and then going back to the drawing board and very specifically figuring out how are you going to actually get where you need to get. You've got to always be aware. There's always change ahead. Um, I think in technology, we face it every day. There's always something new. There's always something shiny. Um, it's really easy to get distracted. Um, that's where that planning really does help you remember where you're headed. But change can be good. And change can bring really good things. And so that's why you don't want a plan that you stick in a drawer. You want to be constantly planning. Because if you encounter a change that can be really good, but you've got to change, for instance, your business model like we did, that's OK. Embrace it. Understand it. Plan for it. And plot how you're going to implement whatever you need to do to understand that change. And then, of course, at the end of the day, you always, always, always have to be tracking, reviewing, and managing. And this is the part of planning and lean planning that I think is most vital. I don't know how people who don't do this as CEOs and leaders sleep at night. I think I would have an ulcer. The fact that I know at any given day where I am compared to the budget and the forecast that I've put together compared to last year compared to two years ago, I know all my numbers. I know what my sales are, my expenses are, my direct cost, my gross margin. I know all of this that's on here and then some. I know my conversion rates, you know, you know, the ECR for Live Plan versus Business Plan Pro. All those numbers give me comfort. And I know it sounds crazy, but they are like my security blankets. Every night I can go to bed and I can actually sleep because I know what I've planned. I know how close I am to achieving it, and I know how that compares to last year. 
so that I'm continuing to move forward and to have that level of comfort. When my dad calls me up and says, what's the cash balance? I can tell it to him right immediately. And it gives him comfort and that I know what I'm doing. And when I hear and I see people who run businesses and they don't know these things, you know, I feel for their health. I just, I don't understand how you could run your business and be sane and not have a heart attack or an ulcer if you don't know these numbers and if you're not constantly tracking, reviewing, and managing. Every month we have a management meeting um, and every month we go over all the numbers. Every week we have an all company meeting that's optional. Um, of the 50 employees, probably 15 or 20 come every week and we go over the weekly numbers. How much did we sell this week in Live Plan? in Business Plan Pro. How much does that compare to how we sold same week last year? How does that compare to plan? What did we expect to do? How did we do in our PPC advertising? Um, we spend almost $100,000 a month on pay-per-click advertising, but we don't spend a dollar that we don't get $1.80 in return. And we track that and we manage that and we review that every week. And I want all my employees to know. I want them to know the numbers. I want them to know what's going on because then they can help and make sure that we get to the right place. So the tracking, the managing, and the reviewing is really what makes the process all come together. And again, you go back to Lean Startup. That's exactly what Eric is saying. Before you launch a company, before you pitch to the VCs, understand that what you have is what somebody wants. Understand that the way you want to sell it is the way people want to buy it. And that's really what the Lean methodology is about. It's about understanding that you've built something people want and that you're going to sell it in a way people want to buy it. And that we deal with every day as business owners. We want to put stuff out there that people want to buy and solves a problem, and we want to sell it to them in a way that they can pay for and they want to buy it in that way. And if you can put that all together and implement that in your business, then you'll have a business that can be flexible, you have a business that can adapt and change, and the more flexibility and the more that you can adapt, the more innovative you can be. And I really do truly believe a lot of what Eric Wall said this morning, that it's about those new ideas and the innovation, and that's what's really going to get you to the next level. Um, it's not about following some script in some book or you know, following a plan that never changes. It's about giving yourself and your employees that flexibility and that permission to innovate. And when you do this, you can do this. You, you can actually give them that. And so every week, we know if there's a red flag. And then we can step back and say, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on? How do we change that? How do we make that different? How do we make an impact? And then let's go out there and test that in the sprint next month. Um, so I think I've gone yeah. a little bit of beyond. Yeah, so we're going to we're okay. have to cut at this point. Okay. So. All right. Well, thank you very much. And if you want to reach me. If you want to reach me and ask any questions, Sabrina at paloalto.com. I'm happy to take uh, questions. And on our website, you can find our phone number. And I'm happy to take phone calls, too. Cool. Thank you.